and that I woke up into this sea of pitch blackness, like a, like a black you've never seen before. All of a sudden, off in the distance, I see like something moving and it's coming at me. And then you could hear noises like hissing and screaming. And then you can see like flames coming off their bodies. And the closer they got, I mean, they got just huge. And I'm just like terrified at this point. And I heard this voice and he said, do not be afraid. I'm with you. Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My name is Randy Kay, and do we have a story that is going to absolutely, well, blow your mind is the way I think of it. This is about a man who is abused as a child by his father. He grew up, went through a tumultuous time, a divorce, found the love of his life, Everything was going very well, successful. He was a successful contractor. And then a very destructive bacterial infection that should, should have killed him by statistically and at least do damage that could not be repaired in the brain. But he is with us today. But here's the catch. He went to heaven. He met God. He has a story to tell about what happened. Doug Kanaki, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you. I uh, have, uh, love sharing my story. I mean, every chance I get the opportunity, I'm always talking to somebody about what had happened to me. Well, this yeah. is this is the book here. Okay, so this book alone is intriguing. So it's being 20 again at 50. Now, <laughs> you suffered from amnesia. So yes. you were a 50-year-old man at the time of this devastating illness. And you went back to being a 20-year-old. Yes. You didn't know your wife. No. You, you didn't know, uh, you know, most people that were in your life, the important people in your life. So we're going to get to that, obviously. So this this is absolutely incredible. But let's go back to your childhood. So this was a very, very hard childhood. Tell us about what happened. You had older brothers who were favored and, and anyway, so please share. Well, I'm uh, one of four children and I'm the second oldest. So I have, have an older brother, a younger sister, and then uh, the youngest is my brother, Scott. Um, and The first time that I can remember that I experienced abuse was I was probably about five years old. And my grandmother had bought me a set of Crayola crayons and I was like totally excited about it because I, you know, never really got anything new, it seemed like. So I went in and I wrote two faces on the wall. One was happy, one was sad. And my dad comes home from work and he said, Who wrote on the wall? And I said, I did. You like it. And I mean, he didn't say a word. He just grabbed me by my britches and hauled me off to the bedroom, pulled my clothes off, took his belt off and just whipped me bloody. I mean, yelling and screaming at me at the whole time. And and I'm like, look, and my mom's standing right there. And I'm, I'm like looking at her like, aren't you going to stop this? And, you know, it just like continued. And uh, I, I was just like, like, I don't know. You're like in disbelief that that just happened, even, even for a five-year-old. And so I look back on that situation today and I wonder why nobody ever like picked up on the fact, why would you have a sad and happy face on the wall? What's going on there? And so, so that was my life growing up and my childhood, you know, um, I mean, like for my kids, I'm always telling them, you did a great job or people who work for me, you did a great job. There was no affirmation there for me. It was, it was just 
you're never going to be good enough. You are not worthy. You know, just all those statements to to beat you down. No, you know, nothing to ever um, make you feel good about yourself. Um, and the, and then the other thing that was going on is we grew up swimming AAU. Uh, so so I mean, we were in in the pool uh, twice a day and and two hours on Saturday. So I mean, we had. Um, a lot going on in that respect, but, but, you know, uh, I, I was not the best swimmer. I'll be the first to admit it, but, you know, every time, you know, the brothers did a, did a outstanding job, won a race or a better time, they got something, you know, my dad would reward them and give them something. Um, me, it just seems like, like, okay, so you have this oddball kid, you know, why not just, show a little love and and do the same for him that just never happened um so so you know when you start this constant badgering and and physical and verbal abuse you know you start believing that about yourself and you you uh and and the worst thing about the whole situation is i retreated into myself so i didn't interact with people um, I was like almost afraid to uh, say anything. Um, so I didn't pay attention in school. Um, and it wasn't until I got in the fifth grade that um, my teacher there had noticed something was going on. And um, she ends up uh, kind of seeing that I'm not reading or writing or doing anything, you know, that a fifth grade uh, student should be doing. And so she ends up uh, getting me through the situation and I, and I really don't ever know what happened to her. Um, so I, I like, I, I can't remember. I, I don't know if it's because of the meningitis or, or, or what, but um, there's like skips in my memory from it. Mm. Um, so after I graduated from high school, um, I uh, started working full time construction, and I uh, uh, wanted to go to college to take architectural technology and construction management. Well, my brothers were in college, you know, and my dad was was helping them out, and I I wanted to go to a local college, so all you had to do was pay for the classes that you needed. No, he would not help me out at all. Mm. I ended up paying my own way to go. Mm. Um, which I look back on it now and I, and I go, you know, it meant more to me that way to, to do it myself. Mm. Um, you went I, through such horrific abuse that most children would succumb to that and they would just give up or, you know, there would be some, the scars would be too, too severe. And you persevered what did you was there anything i know your i think your parents had been church goers if i'm not mistaken yes they so i can't answer that question are they saved i i can't answer that question okay um but you know we were raised lutheran um and i uh the one interesting point you know how you go through catechism classes and and the pastor there asked does anyone here want to be with jesus and i know i was going through like turmoil at that point because i think you're like 11 12 years old at that point and i i remember raising my hand and telling him yes i want to be there i because any place else would have been better than where i was at mm. And so I, uh, um, I can't per se about my parents where where they were at, whether they were they were saved or not. I I have I can't answer that question. The only thing I can go by is how things went, and and I I mean, so when. Physical abuse is handed down from generation to generation. 
you know, that that's something, I don't know if, if it was something that God put in me, but I did not pass that on. I made a promise to myself that I would not treat my kids like that. And I, I treated my kids with love and respect. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I even raised, um, my wife had two boys and I had a boy and a girl. And I raised those kids like they were my kids. Mm -hmm. And I, and I still call them my boys, even, even now that they're grown up men and doing, doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I just, um, I don't know why I have such a, a determined spirit about me to, to get somewhere in life. Um, but when I met my, uh, second wife, um, and her name's Diane. Um, she, to me, is the most amazing person I have ever met. Hmm. And, and I can tell you, after knowing this lady for 28 years, she's the person who I want to see at the end of the day. She's who I want to sit on the couch next to and, you know, talk and rub her feet and, and laugh and, you know, have a good time with her. Um, but I put that girl through some uh, an unbelievable situation. Well, this um, is the love of your life, and oh my gosh! Yes. And eventually, you would forget her entirely. Oh. And yeah. it took, it was some time. Now I'm I'm jumping ahead, obviously, but you know we're at the point at which you, as a young man, were very determined to succeed. You were a contractor. Your father kind of for lack of a better way of putting, kind of putting it, kind of ripped you off. I sure. mean, he was using you uh, and then refused to pay you for uh, the work you did, the full work that you did. Right. And so you were basically on your own then. At, at what age did you really launch into your own? Well, I, I started one business. Um, it was probably back in 78, something like that. And my first wife and I were uh, doing that together. And I mean, I, I did fairly well. Um, you know, I actually built in the parade of homes. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it was a fun time until, you know, uh, Rocky Roads and our marriage hit. And I just, uh, um, you know, went through that nasty divorce and, uh, you know, uh, ended up, uh, I don't know, going for quite some time without wanting to do anything. Um, but, you know, the, the one thing I did have going for me is I got saved when I was 20 years old. Mm. That's uh, interesting because at 50 years old, we mentioned at the beginning of this, you went back to 20 years old. Yeah. So I think it's a pivotal point. Yeah. That's interesting that, that you had forgotten yeah. everything, 30 years of your life. And it was at the point at which you were saved. It was almost like God, I, you know, obviously God didn't want you to have this, but it seemed like he sent you back to the point where you were, where you were at least a sa saved as a 20 year old. Well, I think what he wanted me to remember was the passion that I had. Ah, that's that's what I think he wanted. Ah, interesting. Yeah, because because um, and and it took me a while to to get to that point to actually go. You know, that's what he wanted me to remember. Because mm. um, I was not a happy camper when I first came back. Um, mm. I didn't I didn't even know who I was. Mm. So so in October of two thousand six, I was probably at the peak of, of my business. I mean, I was selling $5 million in, in new home construction. I, I had 10 real estate agents working for me. Wow. I was training those agents to, to list and sell and move those buyers into new construction. I mean, I had a remarkable business going that mm -hmm. I started just doing A to ABC work, you know, just handyman stuff and then build it up to where it was at. But the one thing I didn't have, I didn't have God first mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had everything that, that 
a person could want. Um, but I think God wanted to get my attention. And I think he tried in several different uh, ways. Um, but I really feel that uh, coming down with menococcal meningitis was uh, his way of letting me know, I want you to do something for me. Wow. You um, took a trip to Mexico. Yes. And you came back from that trip to Mexico. You weren't feeling well. The doctors asked you if you had been traveling. And then when you told them that, they well, seem to know that this was this is the meningitis or the most severe form of meningitis had yes. had been contracted. So how, how it happened is we went to Los Cabos, Mexico. We came back, and um, meningitis has like a ten day incubation period. So it was October. I thought um, I was just getting flu because you know it was flu like symptoms when it, when it first starts. And so this was like on a Wednesday um, and I went through all my appointments. I even went and worked out. I came home and I told my wife, Hey, I'm just going to stay, uh, go to bed. I don't feel good. So I get up the next morning and I tell her, Hey, I'm going to stay home from work. And, and that's something I never do. I have always gone to work no matter how sick I was, but for some reason I was not working well that morning. So I spent all day Thursday in bed um, I, for some reason, I got out of bed like 1130 Thursday night and I like get myself into the bathroom. I wanted to take a shower and I, and I, and I'm so delirious. I still have my clothes on. And so I, I figure out I'm having troubles negotiating things. So I go to get out and I slipped and hit the floor like a ton of bricks. And mm. I, uh, managed to pull myself up onto the vanity. And I'm looking in the mirror and all the only thing that had color was the blood running down the side of my face mm. and everything else was like in grayscale. And the last thing I remember saying is, Oh, wow. In slow motion. Mm. It's, it's kind of like how, I don't know if you've ever been put under anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So yes. you kind of like warp out like that. That's the yes. way it felt. Mm. So when my, uh, wife and my youngest son uh, found me, I was still standing up, hanging on to one of the French doors in the bathroom. And they're like waving their hands in front of my face and yelling my name, but I'm already gone. I already blacked out at that point. Wow. And so uh, Diane is like beside herself and, and Nikki calls 911 and EMT show up and they're taking my vitals. And so everybody's thinking it's concussion because of the blood. And they they told my wife, uh, we need to take him downtown because his vitals aren't checking out with concussion. So we get to the hospital and the first thing the doctors ask my wife, um, have you guys been out of the country? And you know, she answered, yeah, we just got back from Mexico. Well. Things change rapidly when they think you got meningitis. I mean, you're you're like like contagious as all get out, and and so it's instant spinal tap, and they check your um, fluid, and if your fluid's cloudy, then they need to check what what strand of meningitis you have. Well, I had um, meningococcal meningitis, which is is like the bad boy of of mm. you know meningitis. Yeah. So I'm in a coma for three days. And so during this time frame, they're uh, telling my wife, um, we don't know if he's going to survive this uh, because he came in unconscious, non-responsive and septic hmm. so, um, on a Glasgow coma scale. That's a three. And they have very little data on people who survive in that condition. So the Glasgow is the test. And a grade of one to ten, it's uh, and, three. And three to fifteen is their scale. Three to fifteen. Three being the worst. Then the worst. So you had the worst case. Yes. So your chances of survival are greatly diminished. Correct. And then even if you survived, the chance of you, as your daughter wrote in the in the book, uh, that you would either be a vegetable or unable to function. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd be like in a non-responsive state. 
Mm. Wow. So three days go by and um, it's like I could hear voices. Um, when I'm, and I heard the neurologist say, hey, everybody, be quiet. He's waking up. So I'm like looking around and I, I have no idea where I'm at. And the uh, neurologist says, hey, I need to ask you some questions. And she says, do you know your name? And I said, uh, yeah, it's Doug. Okay, so at this this point, you have to uh, know my physical condition. So I looked like a stroke victim on my right side of my body. My face was sagging. It didn't move. My right arm shook uncontrollably. Mm. Uh, I lost my hearing on my right side. Um, I went from 190 pounds to 148 in about eight days. Wow. Uh, so I was just like a, a bag of bones at that mm. point. Um, I, I couldn't walk. My center of balance was erased because of the rapid uh, hearing loss. Um, and then my senses, you have like five main senses in your body. Those things got erased. Mm. And I, I had like zero cognitive. So one plus one didn't get the two. Um, so uh, the neurologist says, you know, hey, I want to know your name. I said it was Doug. She goes, what year is it? I said 1969. So, so people who know me think I have a bit of a sense of humor, right? <laughs> so they're <laughs> clowning around. And so then she asked me, who's the president? And I said, Nixon. And <laughs> so everybody's looking at me like, oh, boy. And so there were good friends of ours standing in the room. It was Mark and Colleen. And, I, and Mark looks a lot like my older brother. And I said, hey, Mike. I said, what are you doing here? I said, man, I haven't seen you forever. And then I said to him, I said, well, I see you're still dating your girlfriend, Candy. That was his girlfriend back in 1969. Yeah. And, and you're talking about Candy dating. You're actually, you're talking about your daughter, or that's your daughter, right? No, 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 no. Those oh, okay. were friends of ours. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mark and Colleen were friends of ours. Okay. In, so in you, <laughs> you yeah, didn't was, know uh, anyone in the room. Yeah. Uh, even your wife. Yeah. So, well, okay. So then about that time, my daughter walks in the room. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I knew my daughter. I, and I can't tell you why, but she hands me a CD. And she goes, and I said, what's that? She goes, it's a CD, Dad. You know, it plays music. And I said, no, they're black and about this big around. <laughs> Final records, right? <laughs> and, so, and then I also knew my mother-in-law for some reason. Hmm. And I think a lot of that had to do with because she's an amazing cook. Hmm. And um, so then the neurologist says, do I, ask me if I knew this lady sitting next to the bed and I'm looking at her, I'm shaking my head. No. And she said, just come up with a name. And I'm like, okay. So I called her April. And the first thing my wife says to me is who's April. <laughs> And and I'm I'm like man I just woke up how how you know what kind of question is that you know you know, this this is what I'm thinking in my head and I said to her I said look I said you're a beautiful lady but I says I have no clue who you are and and it was just instant tears running down her mm -hmm. face you know because mm -hmm. she was she put together this army of people to pray for me to to have me come back to to you know, be the same person that I was. And, mm -hmm. and I wasn't, you know, the same at that time, I wasn't the same person. And so, uh, and, and I argued with this lady that she was not my wife. I mean, she kept telling me I'm your wife. And I said, no, you're not. I said, I don't even know who you are. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I said, look, I said, I'm in my apartment and you keep going home. I said, so I, you know, we can't be married. And she, she told me, she goes, you're in a hospital. You're not in an apartment. Mm. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at her like I'm, you know, I don't believe her. And um, so I spent three weeks in a hospital. Uh, I have no idea who I am or what present day is. I have no idea what cell phones are, what computers are, you know, flat screen TVs, garbage disposals, none of that. It 
I have no idea, no concept of that stuff. And so the nurse puts me in a wheelchair, we're rolling down the corridor, and I turn to the nurse and I says to her, I said, am I going to be okay going on with this lady? And she puts her hand on my shoulder and says, you're going to be fine. She's a very nice lady. Mm. So, you know, we get in, she gets me into the car and I'm driving home with her and we finally get into our subdivision and we pull up, you know, our long, long driveway. And I said to her, I said, I go, wow, you live here. I said, you must be loaded. And she goes, you built the place. And I said, I don't even, I've never even seen this home. And so to get into the house, she's literally got to pick me up and, and like help me walk to get inside the home. So we get into the house and she sets me down into my favorite chair that I don't know is my favorite chair. And about a week goes by. And so you have to understand meningitis is head trauma. So she has to watch me 24 seven for four months. Mm. And so she comes in about a week later and puts my laptop down and, and I look at it and I go, what's that? Mm. She goes, that's your computer, honey. You know, you, you do all your CAD drawings, your estimates on all your houses, you, you know, everything that's for your business, you do that. I said, I own a business. And mm. so she flips open the lid, hits the power button. And you know how they light up? Yes. Well, I said to her, so I said, oh, it's a TV. And she goes, no. She goes, what's a password? I said, what's a password? Mm. So, I mean, wow. there was no present day in me whatsoever. Wow. So I end up spending four months going to physical therapy to learn to walk. They put me through cognitive. Um, one of the most pivotal moments of getting some of my memory back was uh, she got me on the computer and had me start looking at family photos. And I realized that this lady who was my caretaker was in every one of these photos with me. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, man, she must be somebody. She's just not a lady taking care of me. And then it was like this flood of emotion just came over me like, like, I don't know how to explain it. Like, like it was just this huge surge of knowing who she is and what I felt about her. And I was like, so overwhelmed. I managed to get myself up out of my chair, holding on to furniture and the walls and whatever else to get to the kitchen to tell her I knew who she is. Mm. And I told her, I said, I know you're my wife. And I mean, she like, busted out in tears right there. And she puts her hands on my cheek and she tells me we're going to get through this. Wow. And so, I mean, that's like, like one of the first signs that I was getting my memory back. Oh my goodness. And now you had been Doug in a coma for several days Yes, in the hospital and you didn't, tell anybody about that except your friend when you came back but you when you were in a coma you you saw god you yes. were there tell us about that what happened when you were in the hospital well i didn't say anything to anybody about that because they already thought i was nuts as it was and so so you know, a good couple of years had gone by and I kept this to myself, but God kept after me. I mean, he kept after me about reassuring me that we had a conversation. And so I was sitting on the couch and I said to my wife, I said, I got to tell you something. And she said to me, um, okay, so I told her, I said, when I was in my coma, that I woke up and that I woke up into this sea of pitch blackness, like a, like a black you've never seen before. Mm. And it was just like I was just hanging around, like, like you're just a spectator and, and like you're wondering what's going to happen. And then all, all of a sudden, off in the distance, I see like something moving and like, like it's coming at me. And I mean, you're, you're like, 
kind of wondering what this is all about. And, and then you could hear noises like, like hissing and screaming. And then you can see like flames coming off their bodies and, and the closer they got, I mean, they got just huge. And I'm, I'm just like terrified at this point. I mean, I'm like at a point of like, what do I do? Where do I go? How do I get out of this situation? And, you know, you feel like, like there's no way out. And I mean, God always gives you a way out, right? Yeah. And the, I heard this voice, and he he said, "Do not be afraid. I'm with you." And I mean, the second God said that, I knew exactly who it was. I mean, I could just like feel the friendship, the love, the you know, you just knew who who it was. And as when he said that, it's like the heavens. And the brightness just showed up. And and I mean, the foundations of heaven are just ginormous. They're massive. And the colors are, I can't even describe what the colors are. Because it because it, to me, like I can see them, but I can't tell you what they are. And and then like the next thing I know, I'm like, like going super fast down the streets of heaven. And and I'm like looking to the side and I'm going, wow. And I'm I'm like incredibly, you know, like like in shock of what's going on. And and then the next thing I know, I'm sitting like in this grassy knoll and I'm I'm just sitting there. And it's like like the grass is kind of tall, and you can see like the mist going through the through the grass, and and all of a sudden God says my name. And I'm like, wow. You know, you're kind of like like in shock and awe. And, and he said, Doug, he said, do you realize what your choices do and what they mean? And, and I didn't say anything. And he says, your choices go everywhere. And then then like this palm just showed up and, and like you could hear the water moving and the, see the mist. And then he drops a pebble in the pond. And, and you know how the ripples when you drop something in the water, just keep going. Yes. He goes, those are your choices. He says, those mm. choices go wherever and they touch whomever. Mm. And, and, and then he shows me like three choices. He didn't say these were my choices that I'm going to make. He just showed me examples of what my choices are and where they went. And I mean, it was in such detail and, and, I was just like, like in awe, you know, that he took the time to do that. And then all of a sudden he said to me, I'm sending you back. And I probably did a really poor case of pleading to, to want to stay because <laughs> I didn't get to stay. And I, and I'm, and I'm like, I said to him, I said, this place is amazing. I said, I've never felt such love and peace in all my life. I mean, it was like in me, it was all around me. I mean, it was just like you were swimming in it. And I just, I was just like, like shocked that I had to go back. And he said, I have something for you to do. I'm sending you back. And so when I, that's when I woke up in the hospital and that's when I heard the voices in the hospital. And so my experience, what a dad is, is, is kind of how I took how God was, that oh. you're not good enough to stay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I know that's messed up. I know that's messed up now. But when I'm in that recovery state of, you know, your mind's not working right. And, and I, I went for the longest time with, um, uh, bad feelings towards God. Wow. You felt I, like God had rejected you because yeah. you'd been rejected by your earthly father. Right. And he sent so, you out of heaven because you were not good enough. And I, uh, you know, I felt I felt abandoned again. So, mm. um, so this is how amazing my wife is. Mm. 
so I mean, we were going to church and we were going to we go to elevation, and uh, um, you know, Pastor Ferdinand's always talking about your purpose and and what's what's you know your purpose in life. What's what does God want you to do? And my my wife's always like, you have a purpose, honey. You, you know, God wouldn't you know do this if you didn't have a purpose. And I uh, I acted like a typical man, you know, you, you don't understand. You just don't understand, you know, my conflict. I, you know, I was not good enough to stay, but yet he sends me back to this hell hole, you know, and that's what I told my wife. I got, how do you go from perfection to, to this hell on earth? And, and I'm just, I'm upset about that. Mm. And so this is probably about three or four years ago. She uh, pulled me aside and she sat me down and she said, honey, I can tell you're still upset. I know you're sharing your story with people, but, but you're not passionate about it. You're not like wanting to do this. And I said, yeah, you're right. And she goes, um, do you know how special you are? And I said to her, not really. And she said, look, she said, God picked you out of millions of people who die to send back and do something for him. Mm. She goes, you've been chosen. And him picking you is showing that he loves you more than anything. Mm. And that he wouldn't give you such a purpose if he didn't love you. And he wouldn't give you this story that he wrote for you to live if it wasn't for the love he has for you. Mm. And so, I, you know, like a man, I kind of said, okay, yeah. And it probably was probably about three months later that, that I, lights finally go off in my head. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, I've been... Uh, going down the wrong paths for a long time. Wow. Um, so I uh, had a unbelievable change of heart. Um, I uh, can't wait till the next time I can tell my story. Mm. Uh, and I'm, that's how the book got started. And, and I have to tell you, I'm a carpenter, not a writer. <laughs> so, um, hey, I I enjoy this book. I I've written uh, several books, and I thought you did a, a, a an, outst an outstanding job. It was very intriguing, and from cover to cover, being twenty again at fifty is an intriguing title in and of itself. It's on Amazon, I assume, in all of the yes, Barnes and Noble and yes. Zulon Press. Uh, so I highly recommend, uh, reading the book. I think there's a possibility it may be made into a movie. Yes. Yes. It, there's, um, uh, several different avenues right now. And, um, so I'm, I'm just waiting for different things to get put together. Um, so I'm, uh, starting a crowd crowd funding, uh, thing, um, to be able to, um, you know, get the screen right, put together, and and you know the the different steps that you have to go through in order to get it. Um, yeah. Where's the uh, where's the crowdfunding? Where can um, people reach that? I haven't picked the site yet. I was okay. I was waiting for um, Jacqueline Witt and mm -hmm. um, is it Isaiah? Are are putting together? We just did a. Um, a podcast with them. Okay. What they're going to do, where they're uh, putting a pitch together. Okay. So we'll update in the body of this uh, interview, I'll update that with uh, information if you'd like to uh, to okay. go to that crowdfunding. Okay. Um, I, um, if, go sorry. ahead. I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, go ahead, please. Well, I also put together a website called being 20 again at 50.com. So, uh, um, Everything's going to get like attached to that. Okay, good, good. We can keep in touch with you. I've got. I love 
going to heaven. Uh, you know, been there myself. And, and of yeah, course, I've... <laughs> <laughs> so people ask, what does God look like? Now, when you, when you saw him and he's speaking to you, and I'm going to ask a follow-up question about the, these kind of demonic looking figures as well. But what, 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 how did he appear to you? Okay. I just saw a figure. I never did get to see his face. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so he was like standing there, but I, but it was it, like, I couldn't like focus in on him, but you could feel him everywhere. Like, like it just flowed. I mean, it was uh -huh. just, and I, and I remember like different uh, points of where I was at in heaven. Like at one point I was like in, in the clouds, like I was hovering and I was looking down over my family and they're all crying and, and like missing me. And, and I mean, I had this like intense love for them, like, mm. like, uh, I, I can't explain that love. It's, but it's, you probably know it, but uh, there were other people like me in the clouds looking down on their families. Ah. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, um, I don't know how to explain it, but, but then the, the next thing I knew, and this was like, like just before I uh, left heaven, I was, in a spirit form like like i didn't have like a physical body but it was like super bright um and i could see out my eyes and i was standing there talking to somebody but i don't know who it was hmm. i mean it was it was like um it was so intense hmm. i mean I, and I, and and to this day, I cannot wait to go back. Mm. I mean, it's just like like a, an energy that I can't refuse. That that's where I want to be. Um, you know, those of us who have been there say the same thing: heaven is our home, and we long yeah. to go home. And then the. The, the figure that you were before is intriguing. I don't know if the angel maybe or a person who was there uh, with you that had, had, uh, had left their body or anyway. Um, let's go to the dark figures, the ones there. Because in your book, you explain that you felt, I believe, that they were your old self. Oh, no, let me let me explain. Okay, so when I came back from heaven and I kept telling my wife that I was innocent. So I felt like when I first came back, like I was still a part of heaven. Like, like you know, there was no sin in me at that point. And so as time went on and I started remembering who I was and, I, and I'm, I'm like, you know, like all these memories are, are starting to come back. And like every time I would go to sleep, like this Rolodex was playing in my mind. Like, like I hadn't like, like you kind of knew what was going on, but you didn't, you know, because it was new to you, but it was still you. And so, so like there was this two year period where this dark figure started showing up in my dreams and and like like even during the day i could feel like like it was there like it was haunting me and i i was just like you know it, it was something that like i i tried to fight it like i was trying to 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 like keep it away like i don't i don't want that in me i don't want to be a part of that and it was just like one day all of a sudden i woke up and this beast is inside me. Mm -hmm. And I come to realize that that was my old nature. Mm. Boy, the, it, yeah. It, it was the weirdest 
and most difficult thing to go through to realize that that's you. That's you. Wow. Kind of like your old self or yeah. your yeah. sinful nature. Uh, right. Because yeah. I kept telling my wife, you know, I'm innocent. I, I, you know, like, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm innocent. I don't, you know, know anything. And she was, um, and you have to know my wife. She's Italian. <laughs> she, <laughs> so she, she has a very strong personality. And she um, lets you know when you're out of bounds. And, <laughs> and so she has, uh, you know, an opinion about things. And she told me very bluntly, you're not innocent. And, and I kind of looked at her and I, I was stunned that she would say something to me like that. And I said, okay, and, you know, let it go. And I'm, I'm not um, much of an arguer. I don't, I don't <laughs> like the um, conflict at all. I, I mean, I'll do whatever it takes just to make peace. Yeah. And, I'm, uh, I'm curious was whether God was allowing you to see these dark figures in this dark pitch black place to kind of show you who you were before you were redeemed. I don't know. It's just it's possible. It's, he just revealed that for a purpose. Nothing is nothing is uh just happenstance as it concerns God's children. Well the the one thing that I kind of put together was I, I was never really in hell. Yes. But hell was coming at me. Ah. Uh, you know, because the demons were coming at me. And, you know, and God put a stop to that, you know, just like that. Um, you know, because our um, pastor's always talking about, you know, you, you always have a way out. God always gives you a way out. Yes. And, you know, he's always there for you. Yes. He doesn't give up. A lot yeah. of people fear uh, that hell experience, but you know, if you're in Christ, he's watching over you. Yeah. He'll rescue you. Uh, regardless, you are bought and paid for. Right. And that was, that was you. Uh, they w Another facet of these demonic uh, beings or forces is they don't want to give up. They're so stupid. They think they can take one of God's children. And uh, God says, no, 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 no. Well, you just mine. give it a point right there mm. that you uh, can. Yes. Wow. Another thing you said at the beginning of this interview, Doug, is that he brought you back 30 years mm -hmm. uh, when you became born again as a Christian. It's, I mean, that's just the the phenomena of that. Did you have the same enthusiasm or was it, well, you were a 20 year old essentially uh, so, again no, uh, as a 50 year old body. Really put it together. I mean, I was so sick at that point. Yeah. Um, I, I uh, yeah, my, my mind was just a, a mess at that point. Yeah. Um, when I first woke up, um, and for the first couple of years, my mind was just, I mean, like people would come up to me and tell me that they knew me and I'd be like, I don't, I don't know you, you know, I mean, it, it was that bad. Um, and still today, like if people are talking about something that happened back then or whenever, you know, prior to getting sick, um, I would have no knowledge of what they're talking about. And mm -hmm. in order for me to um, remember it, I would need a picture. Like they would have to paint me a very clear picture of what had taken place in order for me to remember it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think I remembered my wife uh, so clearly from the photos is, is because you know, they were pictures and I could, I could like latch onto it. Mm. So it, it uh, was, it, it was a very, very difficult journey oh. to get to the place to where I'm at today.
I can't imagine. And that's the, from from what you've told us or and in your book, that that's the means by which to restore a person from amnesia is that, that to show them a visual, yes. uh, to connect to connect those nerve waves, brain waves to what actually the person is or the uh, the situation was. Um, so it sounds like now all of these years, um, now you were a very successful contractor and you moved, you went through a period of financial struggles. Obviously you had lost that ability and, and so you moved and then there were continual struggles. And then today, tell us where you're at and uh, well, you don't have to tell us your location, but how, how, how is Doug today? What's Doug doing? Well, um, Doug today is, um, a very different person. Um, I am, uh, concerned about where people are in their lives. Are, are they made that decision to follow Jesus or are they, uh, going to hell? And my, Biggest fear or um, heartache is that people don't know. Mm. And I mean, there's people all around us that don't know. I mean, I, I have three boys that don't know. They've been around it. They don't know. Mm. And they fight it. Um, and it. And I mean, we pray for them every day. You know, we uh, ask Jesus to get a hold of their hearts and their minds and, and, you know, beat them if you got to, you know, mm. but, um, you know, it's, it's hard look. Um, but I, the one uh, amazing thing that, that happened um, here in the last few years is uh, my oldest son, Christopher is married to uh, a lady by the name of Erica. And she, they have two uh, girls. Um, and uh, so the girls would come home from uh, uh, the, it's a, it's a, a Bible school or, or um, daycare uh, ran by a church. Okay. So they were learning Bible verses and, and songs and, and they would come home and sing them and, and what have you. And um, so uh, Erica was raised Catholic and, and so was my wife. So Erica asked me, what is this to be saved? What, what is that? And I said, that's salvation. That's, you know, Christ dying on the cross for our sins and, and, you know, uh, raising from, from the dead and, and, you know, uh, sitting on the right hand of God the Father, that's that's what your salvation is all about. And we need to ask Jesus uh, to forgive you and and uh, ask him into your heart and into your life. And, and so I explained it to her, but she never hmm. said anything at that time. Hmm. And so I, I just, you know, I, and I don't pressure people. I just let it go. And about two or three weeks later, she texted me and said, I did it. And I said, what'd you do? And she said, I prayed the prayer. And I said, welcome to the family. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, you know, I mean, she takes the girls to church, you know, every, every chance, every Sunday she goes. And uh, so, um, yeah, it, it was an amazing thing that happened. Beautiful story. I, at the end, your wife, Diane, and your daughter write about your experience, and it was very interesting to get their perspective as well. They added from their point of view what was uh, what was going on. So, Doug, this is the point where I have the great honor of inviting you to pray for our audience, if you would be so kind. Okay. Love to. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for today. I want to thank you for waking us up, and I want to thank you for the blessings that you give us. 
And um, and I just ask that we continue to give you the glory and the praise and everything that we do and that we honor you in all that we do. Um, and we just ask that you continue to go before us. I ask that you continue to watch over our families, that you bless them, uh, that you give them wisdom and that you would give them the wisdom to come to know Jesus. And we want to thank you for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm. Amen. And thank you for that, Doug. And for those of you who don't know uh, the Lord Jesus personally, uh, then you have a great opportunity now, as Doug said, to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior for what he did on the cross. He sacrificed himself. He did that for you. And if you uh, confess him and also he sacrificed himself to forgive you of the consequences of sin. We have all sinned. So that means that you need to ask forgiveness of those sins from him so that he can absolve you basically from your sins and the consequence thereof. And if you do that or have done that, then you are a new person. Your, your sins have been washed as far as the East is from the West. They're gone. Now, it doesn't mean you won't sin, but it means you're a new creation. The Bible tells us you are a new creation. You're a new person. You're in, you have invited, surrendered. You have invited Jesus to become Lord of your life. So that means the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God resides within you. And, and you're the temple. The old temple passed away many thousands of years ago now. You're it. There's a, there's a fellowship that God has with you. We want to know at Randy K, Randy K org if, if you've done that, because we want to celebrate with you because it's a celebration in heaven for you having been, as Jesus told Nick, Nicodemus, born anew. That is your spirit has come alive through Christ. And so that's a great, great event. Doug, I've got to say, this is one of the most incredible stories I have ever heard. And I've heard some incredible ones, by the way. <laughs> this is absolutely incredible. You went from being 50 to 20 again. That's who you were. And, and you lived that way. And you had to, to relearn those 30 lost years. And, and you did to a large extent, and it's an ongoing process, but it changed your life entirely. And I can see uh, the love of Christ through you. And uh, we thank you so much for being with us today. Any parting words before we close? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I think my biggest concern is, um, you know, how we treat one another. And um, yeah, we just, I, I think we all need to be uh, a whole lot more kinder to each other and, mm -hmm. and need to appreciate what the other person has. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, because I, I tell my wife, I love her every day, every chance I get. Um, and every chance I, I get to talk to my kids, I'm just like, you just don't want to let it go. You don't want to not let a day go by um, that you're showing kindness and love to people. Mm, I love that. And this is coming from a, a man who has a boy to not have the love of a father and receive that love from heaven. And even then, having been returned, felt that was God's rejection and you learned no that he honored you as one of just a select few that was given the opportunity to come back to share the love of God. And uh, just a, a point, I know some people may be asking, what about your uh, father? Uh, you desired some reconciliation. Uh, he died. That did not happen. He's in God's hands or was in God's hands at that point. But... Um, but you, 
you, Doug, you became that, that father. You broke the cycle of abuse and you became that loving father. So I applaud you for that. I applaud you for being that loving father. That's well, thank a great God I have accomplishment. Well, it's, uh, I, I, I just, I, I have the greatest admiration for you for that alone, because I, I worked with uh, abused children uh, years ago and I, uh, it got to me so much. I just, I, I became more and more depressed by just knowing their stories and what they were going through. So that you overcame that you, most of them didn't, by the way. So you're, you're like in the, well, I don't know, five percentile or whatever of those who actually overcome that kind of abuse to, to reach level, some level where they can even sustain themselves and you were successful. Um, so I, I applaud you for that. And if you are going through or know of somebody who has uh, gone through some abuse and we have, well, we have eight, three 800 numbers at randyk.org on the contact page. We've partnered with some ministries for 24-7 uh, lines that you can call and you can um, you know, get help. And um, just don't, don't let it get to the point where, where you just don't want to be here. Now, Doug and I can say we don't want to be here, but <laughs> that, that, that's a healthy thing. <laughs> we have that's that purpose, place. right, Doug? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> that well, is so true. Again, Doug, I thank you. Thank you so much. So we have thank some, you, well, thank you immensely. We have some parting words for you. If you are in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take Boom. care. Thank you. God Randy. bless. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.